Hi, uh, this is the second lecture on homeostasis. Um, I'm going to try to keep this one relatively short. Um, so uh, last time what we spoke about was um, sort of the approach to physiology and um, body fluid compartments and transport, the types of um, physiology that occur when you're trying to transport things from point A to point B. Um, now we're going to skip over to a topic that's going to seem unrelated for a minute, but it'll come back together. And it is um, the concept of negative feedback, <clears throat> which is really an integral concept in human physiology. Really, to me, it is the thing that I use as a predictor of what's going to happen. If it's a new situation that I've never met before, I think, okay, well, it's probably going to follow the negative feedback framework. So let me introduce you, um, you've probably met it before, but let me introduce you to negative feedback as it uh, um, applies to human physiology. So um, basically what negative feedback is, is um, the primary mechanism that the human body uses to maintain what we call homeostasis. So you've talked about homeostasis many, many times, but in physiology, you're really going to have to understand homeostasis. What homeostasis really is, is homeo implies same and stasis implies stability. So it's maintaining a relatively constant internal environment, despite what's going on in the external environment. So even if it's 102 degrees outside, you do not want your physiology to uh, approach 102 degrees. Um, your proteins will denature, your physiological functions won't work at that um, temperature for very long or very efficiently. So you want to maintain a relatively constant internal environment despite what's going on in the external environment. So the way that you are going to accomplish that is via what we call negative feedback. And so negative feedback says that what I'm going to need to do is to notice when something changes from the ideal and then um, make a change to bring it back. So this little figure shows you basically the, the thing, um, a negative feedback example with a car. So if your car's set point, meaning what your speedometer um, is set at or maybe what you set um, your cruise control at, is um, 60, mil uh, 60 miles per hour and then you start going up a hill, right? What's going to happen is the speed decreases and there's an error signal between the actual speed, which is down here, maybe 55, and um, the desired speed or the set speed that you wanted, which was 60. And as long as the error signal is given, what's going to happen is you are going to um, start changes that will try to bring it back. So you are going to increase, for instance, the amount of gas flow until the speed increases and then it goes back up to the set point. So really what negative feedback is, is we're going to have to dump our former associations with the word negative because it doesn't mean bad. It's really neutral, but a lot of times it's good because it maintains homeostasis, which keeps you alive. Um, it also doesn't mean less than because what negative feedback does is it will oppose whatever change occurred. So for instance, if my body temperature starts to go up um, and it goes up to 101, then negative feedback will serve to bring it back down. But that's not what makes it negative. It's the opposition or negation of what's actually occurring. Um, if my body temperature goes down, um, negative feedback will f serve to bring it back up. So the purpose of negative feedback is to restore whatever variable you're talking about back to homeostasis when it's disturbed. So negative in this instance does not mean less than and it does not mean bad. It means that any deviation from the normal value is resisted or negated and the value is returned back to where it was to, I ask you whether it's a set point or a range, and we'll cover that a little bit later. So what does a graph of negative feedback tend to look like, right? So it depends um, on what variable you're looking at, but they tend to really have a lot in common. So let me show you what a graph of negative feedback might tend to look like. So typically speaking, by the way, when you are doing 
um, physiological graphs, the horizontal axis, um, axis is um, often time, because quite a, f quite a few physiological variables will vary over time. And then the vertical axis, or y-axis, is the dependent variable. And it's anything that varies over time. So in this instance, we are going to, let's look at an example of body temperature. So let's make the variable body temperature. And so the way that this graph is set up, it says that body temperature varies over time. If I switch the x and y axes, it would tell something that was untrue. It would say that time varies as your body temperature varies. So if you start sweating, you increase the speed of time. Worst superpower ever. So um, what will a graph of negative feedback tend to look like? So let's just look at um, an example in a normal human and say, OK, so we've got this number in our head that our body temperature should be around 98.6. FYI, it doesn't really ever stay there, but that's an average that you've got in your head, and it varies between people. So I don't have numbers on the um, x or y axes, but to pretend that I do. And let's say that this line right here is 98.6. So if you were looking over the course of a 24-hour period, what would your body temperature do? Well, you've been a human for a little while and you know that it doesn't stay exactly the same. So if you got up in the morning and um, you were just starting to get out of bed, then your body temperature would probably be below 98.6. And then as you started moving around, it would increase. And then, of course, um, if you eat some breakfast, sit down for a little while, goes up, down, eat some lunch, go sit on your butt for a little while, um, work out, take a nap, right? You're getting everything done, make some dinner, walk your dog, have sex, go to sleep, right? So what happens is it tends to vary around this ideal over time. It doesn't tend to stay at the ideal for any length of time. So the ideal that we have in our head, like 98.6 or 120 over 80, is really a time averaged mean. Um, and so what a graph of negative feedback tends to look like is if there is an ideal, which we would call a set point, um, and this is in Celsius, but here's your set point. What would happen is we would vary around the set point, but as soon as I was far away from the set point, I would start instituting changes to bring it back to the set point, and that's really important. So varying from the set point is not problematic at all. Um, staying away from the set point for long periods of time. So for instance, if I stayed up here at 37.5 or at 101, then I might start having physiological changes because I was far away from the ideal. So um, let's talk about how you can accomplish this. So in order to, for instance, make changes, you need to be able to recognize that you are varying from the set point you need to be able to have a mechanism to make a change to get you back to the set point. And you need to have all of these portions in your body that have this goal and these specific functions. So what these are is these are called a reflex arc. And here's an example of a reflex arc. You probably met reflex arcs when you um, looked at the nervous system in anatomy. But I want to introduce you to the concept of a reflex arc. And so we will use kind of a simple reflex arc, and then we'll look at this one as well. So if we're talking about the components of a reflex arc, so I want you to think of temperature control in your home and then temperature control in your body. So the components of a reflex arc are <clears throat> you have to have a stimulus. And um, the stimulus right here is um, a detectable change, um, the detectable change in the internal or the external environment. Um, so like it has to be measurable or else you couldn't, um, you couldn't fix it. So if you're talking about um, temperature in your home, then 
if your kids leave the door open in the middle of summer, then the room temperature goes high. So that's a detectable change. And then the next thing you have to have is a sensory receptor, which means that something somewhere can actually detect the change. So it's a sensor that can detect the change or the stimulus. So in your home, this of course would be the thermometer portion of your thermostat, not the portion that you set, but the portion that is detecting the temperature that exists. But then you're gonna to have to have the other components of a reflex arc. Like you are going to have to send that measured information through what we call the afferent pathway or the input pathway. This will communicate the measured um, variable to the place that knows what it should be. So in the human body, this would be sensory. Um, here it would basically be in your thermostat, it would be input. Um, and then you have to have a portion of the home or the portion of the body that knows what the variable should be. And we're gonna call that the integration center. And the integration center for temperature in your home would be um, the thermostat portion, the portion that you actually set and say that you want it at 72 or 74 or whatever you want it at. So that's the thermostat portion, but you still haven't fixed it. You've just measured and sent it to the place that knows what it should be. Now what happens is you see whether the error signal right here is big enough that you should do something about it. So if you had it set at 72 and it was 72.4, do you think that you necessarily want to turn on the air conditioner? What happens is there is an acceptable error signal and then there's an unacceptable error signal. If you turned it on every time it hit 72.4, the thing would never turn off. And that would be really, really energetically inexpensive. So let's say you've got a large error signal and that large error signal, is, if it's set at 72, it's at 77. And that says, okay, that's too far away. Then what it's going to do is institute the change by sending a signal out the efferent pathway, and the efferent pathway sends it to effectors, things that can effect a change in that particular variable. And so in the home example, this of course would be your air conditioner, right? And then what would happen is you would narrow the error signal till it gets right up to the set point or close to the set point, and that response is going to feed back in as a new stimulus so that you know when to stop the reflex arc. So let's go through the same sort of temperature example in our own body um, and look at how the reflex arc is actually going to use negative feedback to maintain homeostasis. So if for instance I went and ran around the block and it's 100 degrees today, um, if I went and ran around the block and it's 100 degrees, what's going to happen is that stimulus, that um, body temperature, is going to be detectable in me because of um, temperature receptors. So the stimulus is going to be detected by sensory receptors and these sensory receptors for temperature are all over in my body, mostly assessing the temperature of the extracellular fluid like we talked about in the last time. And they are going to say, hey, this error signal, or actually they're not actually going to assess the error signal. Um, maybe I'm set at 98.6 and they are going to be measuring 101 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they are going to send that information through the input, input or afferent pathway. Um, and here it's going to be a nervous system pathway and they're going to send it to the integration center for temperature in my body. And the integration uh, center for temperature um, is actually in my brain and it's mostly the hypothalamus and the integration center is going to compare 101 to 98.6 and that's going to say that error signal is too big and then it's going to send out a stimulus via the efferent or output pathway to any effector that can effect a change and so it's going to vasodilate blood vessels to send more of the hot blood to the cool surface so it can cool me down will also activate um, uh, activate sweat 
um, sweat glands and it might even communicate to my brain that actually you need to go sit down in a cool room because it's really hot. So all of these effector organs and then what's going to happen is collectively those effector organs are going to produce a response that lowers my body temperature and then as it lowers the body temperature what's going to happen is I'm going to feed that new temperature back in as a new stimulus right here and then I'm going to compare that new stimulus to the um, ideal again. And so now if I have um, cooled the body down and it's not 101, it's um, instead of 98.6, it's 99.1. Um, that air signal may be small enough that I can actually turn off the sweating and um, turn off the vasodilation. It depends on what the acceptable error signal is. So I'm going to feed it back in and as soon as the error signal is so small that it's no longer worth it to activate the effector organs, then I'm going to shut the whole thing down. So this is called negative feedback because you're actually feeding this in and it's only going to shut off. Um, negative. It's going to inhibit the reflex arc when it gets close enough to the ideal. The actual gets close enough to the ideal. So that's called negative feedback inhibition. And let's look at one more example. So this one is showing you a blood glucose example. So whatever my normal blood glucose is, you guys probably don't have that number memorized yet. Um, and let's say I um, my blood glucose was high, like I just drank a milkshake and my blood glucose was high. And what's going to happen is that high blood glucose is going to go um, be detected. It's not showing you each of the individual parts, but the stimulus is going to be detected by a re receptor. The receptors are actually in um, the pancreas and so are the um, uh, the afferent path. Oh, sorry, uh, the afferent pathway is going to go through the bloodstream and the integrating center is going to be the beta cells of the receptors. And then what those are going to do is to send out the efferent pathway that's gonna go through the bloodstream. And in this instance, it's actually going to be um, insulin. It's gonna go out through the bloodstream. And what it's going to do is it's going to cause the cells to take up the glucose. And when they take up the glucose, what it's going to do is drop that level of blood glucose and then I'm going to feed that new low level of blood glucose back in and it's going to in inhibit the pathway that I just started. Now why is this negative feedback really important? Negative feedback inhibition says that when you get where you want you need to shut off the mechanism so that it doesn't create the opposite problem. Because, for instance, when we were talking about body temperature, if my body temperature was too high and I started sweating and vasodilating and I went way past the set point, then what would happen is I would create the opposite problem. Okay, so negative feedback inhibition. So the last thing I want to talk about today is the concept of feed forward mechanism. And so interestingly about the body is that the body can actually learn and start to predict what's going to be necessary in the future. And this is sometimes called anticipatory homeostasis. Anticipatory homeostasis means that if, for instance, I get up every morning at 8 a.m., um, then I know my metabolism is going to need to increase. I'm going to need to start getting up and getting going um, right after 8 a.m. And what will happen is um, if I am very, very regular about doing that, getting up at 8, going to bed at 11.30 every night, what will happen is my body will start to say, okay, you haven't given me the stimulus yet, but you usually give me the stimulus to get up at this time, so I'm going to start doing that for you. I'm going to say, I know that it's not 8 yet, but it's close to 8, and I feel like we'd be more um, effective, our metabolism would be more effective if we started to increase the metabolism so that we would actually be going right at 8. So it increases the speed of the body's homeostatic responses and it mi minimizes fluctuations. Um, it's really only useful if you're very, very regular with that variable. If you're really irregular like I am, especially since this whole quarantine thing started, I could go to bed at literally any time, I could get up at any time, there is no regularity to it, then this wouldn't be useful for me. 
But if I was super duper regular, what would happen is no matter how much I decided I was going to pull an all nighter, when um, it got to be about 1130, I would start getting sleepy right before then. If I went on vacation and I didn't want to wake up at 8 a.m., I would start waking up. And this is going to continue <coughs> to be used as long as it helps most of the time. So it's really not the opposite of negative feedback. It's getting a jump on negative feedback. It's saying, I think I know what you're going to do here. So it would be like when you walk into a room and you smell chocolate chip cookies, one of the things that needs to happen right after that usually is that you're going to need salivary amylase to start breaking down the sugars and the chocolate chip cookies. So you're going to start to salivate because you smell the chocolate chip cookies because that's what happens most of the time. And it's saying, oh, I know what happens next. I'm going to go ahead and do this. So it's really getting a jump on or anticipating a needed body change. Um, and if it is effective, a large percentage of the time you will continue to do it. But if you're a person like me who has really, really irregular sleep-wake cycles, for instance, and my alarm doesn't go off, I am not waking up. If you are the person who gets up at 8 a.m. every day and their alarm doesn't um, go off, they're probably going to wake up. Okay, stop there for today.